Okay, you're now virtually a household name. In May 2020, following a 30-year career as a biotechnology venture capitalist, you were appointed chair of the UK Vaccine Task Force, reporting directly to the Prime Minister to lead the UK's efforts to find and manufacture a COVID-19 vaccine. This was a voluntary assignment. On the 8th of December, 2020, the UK began rolling out its program of COVID-19 vaccinations, the first Western country to do this. And you stepped down in December, 2020. Without Kate's work and with, without the work of a fantastic team of scientists, both here in the UK and around the world, I think it's fair to say that we wouldn't be sitting in this room today. And I think all of us here and all of us across the country owe Kate an enormous debt of gratitude. For <laughs> oh dear. Thank you very much for being here this morning. So to begin this discussion, it might be worth recalling a few words from The Economist magazine, which were written in November 2020, just a short time before the vaccine rollout. Deliverance, when it arrives, will come in a small glass vial. First, there will be a cool sensation on the upper arm as an alcohol wipe is rubbed across the skin. Then there will be a sharp prick from a needle. 21 days later, the same again. As the nurse drops the used syringe into the bin with a clatter, it will be hard not to wonder how something so small can solve a problem so large. And then I think you, Kate, in October 2020, wrote in the medical journal The Lancet, no vaccine in the history of medicine has been as eagerly anticipated as that to protect against severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. However, we do not know that we will ever have a vaccine at all. Your words, one year ago. So perhaps, Kate, you could start by looking back on the past 18 months. Cast your mind back to the situation in March, April 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic here in the UK. Maybe you could describe the challenging situation that the country was in at that time. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you for a lovely introduction. And thank you all for coming. <laughs> I can't quite believe there are so many people here. But um, so the first, my first involvement was on the, uh, an email on the 1st of April, which felt like an April Fool's. <laughs> But it was inviting me to join Patrick Valance's um, expert advisory group um, uh, on vaccines, to which I responded to say, well, I don't know anything about vaccines, so you know, why do you want me? And his reaction, his response was, uh, we actually need somebody who understands the small innovative company landscape to complement all the largely academic vaccine experts. So I joined this group um, and we had three one hour sessions. And at the first session, um, and this was sort of an advisory group to what was basically a team of civil servants within Bayes, so the business department. Um, uh, I asked the, the experts uh, on, the, on this advisory group what they thought was the chances of success of any of the potential vaccine candidates uh, actually ever proving to be safe and effective. And the response from the experts was it was about 15% for those vaccines that were already in clinical trials, of which were probably three or four. Um, and if vaccines weren't yet in the clinic, it was probably a 10% chance of success. And so that was a very sobering view to begin with. Um, there were, at that point, about 190 odd different vaccine candidates at different stages of development. Um, uh, and what we knew then was the quickest time that any vaccine had ever been developed uh, at that point was five years. So the mumps vaccine was developed in five years, but that was 50 years ago. 
and we didn't have any uh, experience of actually doing anything more quickly than that. So from the uh, definition of the sequence through to the actual approved vaccine. So it seemed like a massive, massive uphill struggle with those sorts of odds that the experts were assigning to the likelihood of any of these vaccines working and with the need to do so quickly because it didn't seem like uh, social distancing was a way out. It was a way to limit viral transmission, but it wasn't, it wasn't a, a solution to the actual pandemic itself. So um, it certainly felt quite a daunting task um, in, in April, which is when I was involved. And then on the third uh, uh, meeting uh, I joined, um, I then get a text um, during that meeting um, from Matt Hancock. And I just, I'm not used to all this. This is how government works as they text each other. And um, so he texts me and says, can you speak? And I was actually obviously in the middle of this vaccine advisory meeting. So I said, no, I can't. I'm, I'm working for you guys actually at the moment. And so we speak after that. Um, and that's when he says, would I join as chair, full-time chair, because they now recognize they want to actually do something more than a you know, very part-time advisory group. Um, and I wasn't very clever because I, I didn't sort of anticipate why he wanted to speak or, or what was it about. So I did my normal sort of, why me? And, and uh, surely that you've got somebody better that could do this. Uh, and eventually he said to me, Kate, none of us have done this before. Um, we're asking you to do this. And I said, well, hold on, who is we? And he said, well, I've just come from the Prime Minister um, and he's asked you. So I said, well, I need to think about it. And I did think about it for, for 24 hours. And Jess, if he's in the audience, was very influential, as you might imagine, uh, as was my family. And I then I spoke to a few people who'd worked with government just to see if it was going to be doable. Um, and uh, went back the following day to say, I'll do it on these conditions, which was, you know, six month contract, able to um, recruit my own team. Also importantly, um, uh, getting a quick decision because I hadn't, hadn't had a lot to do with government. I didn't know how the rules work, but I was pretty sure that the rules were very slow. So I said I wanted a, a very quick decision-making process. So anyway, after I'd set out the conditions, I then get the next text, which is from, from the Prime Minister saying, can you speak? So <laughs> uh, I then, uh, and I was on the phone at the time, so I then spoke to him. And actually my main message, well, his message to me was, I want you to do three things, get vaccines for the UK, ensure that successful vaccines get rolled out worldwide and put plans in place to make sure that we are better prepared for any future pandemic. Uh, and my message back to him was this was a real tall order and that the chances are uh, we would fail. Didn't mean we shouldn't do it, but the, the likelihood was that this was not going to work and also that we were going to have to put cash upfront at risk so that if any of these vaccines worked, we were going to have to have already committed to the scale up and the manufacture of these vaccines. So if they were shown to be safe and effective, um, we would be in a position to then roll out quickly. So that's how it all started. And it was all, it felt pretty hairy at the time, actually. Um, uh, and, then, and then we got going. Fantastic, well, that's so interesting. Thank you, Kate. Um, maybe on to another point now. I think you said last year, no vaccine has ever been developed against any human coronavirus but there are good coronavirus vaccines for chickens and pigs. Perhaps you could give us um, a short explanation about how long it typically takes to develop a new vaccine. I mean, for example, vaccines for polio, mumps, typhoid, and so on. What, what's the typical time it takes? So it normally takes, I mean, the average is, about, is 10 years, roughly. And, and normally what happens when you're developing um, vaccines or therapeutics, actually, is you have a period of discovery. So you've actually got to make whatever it is, whatever vaccine it's going to be. Um, uh, and then you've, got to t then you've got to test it. And then normally, once you've done all the full testing, that's at the point at which you start scaling it up. And so what happened here, which was different, was uh, the most advanced vaccine formats, so the adeno and the mRNA vaccine formats, were very quick to make. Because basically what those are, are you drop in the genetic sequence that encodes the spike protein, either naked into a fatty envelope, which is mRNA, or into a um, viral uh, vector, which is the adeno. So they're actually pretty quick to make. The, the Moderna... Uh, vaccine itself was designed in 42 days and, and, and made. So what, what um, happened this time was 
this, the safety testing, which is the first time you put this foreign material into a person, um, uh, that's, that process was completely unchanged. So that was not accelerated. That was done at, if, in, in, any, in m most cases, was done at substantially larger numbers to establish the safety of these vaccines. Um, but what then happened was having, once the safety, the, the initial safety had been established, then there was uh, availability of cash that allowed you to accelerate the rest of the, the uh, clinical trials. So I don't, I don't know how many of you remember um, the announcements last year, but when Oxford first announced their immunogenicity data, which is basically the data that shows that their vaccine was able to elicit an, an immune response as measured by neutralizing antibodies, um, when they announced that data, which was in um, early July, they were already well through um, the recruitment of a phase three clinical trial. Now, normally that wouldn't happen. So normally you do a, every, every part of the clinical trials uh, would be done sequentially. But because we had, fat, we had cash, we were able to accelerate that big pivotal study before we actually had the immunogenicity data. And that's how we were able to compress the, the actual clinical trial process which is unusual. So there was no shortcuts taken in, in safety, but there was the risk of putting cash up front to, to accelerate the clinical studies. Um, and then in parallel, we were scaling it up. And so this is something that is really amazing. So uh, it was actually during the football match between Norwich and Liverpool uh, in February last year, when Oxford scientists called um, the Bio Industry Association, which is our, asso our industry association that brings together obviously all, all the companies in the bio industry, um, and said, we need your help um, to scale up our vaccine. So they had limited scale up within the university itself, um, but they didn't obviously have mass commercial uh, scale up or skills to do that. So they called the industry association in the middle of February 2020 and said, we need your help. And what happened was then a coalition of different basically CDMOs, so contract development manufacturing organizations, came together to basically do all of the, both first the clinical trial manufacture and then the scale up work to actually get it into bulk um, industrial scale uh, manufacture. And the industry did so without any contract or any payment or anything. The, this was in starting in February. Vaccine task force hadn't even been conceived of until April and contracts were not put in place ultimately till um, late May. So it's, it's something that's really quite interesting as to the people actually knew uh, that they had the skills that were needed and they stepped up when they needed to, not because they were told to or because the legal contracts told them to, but because they knew it was the right thing to do. And that is why the UK uh, was so far ahead in many ways. And so by the time I arrived, we actually had a, at least a, a group of people supporting the, the Oxford vaccine. And of course, bioprocessing or advanced manufacturing, in some ways it doesn't matter what you make. You're growing up biological systems, and whether you're growing up virus or mRNA or protein or antibodies, it's the same broad set of skills that are needed. And it was that early foresight and that early collaboration that really made a difference. And you will remember, I've, maybe, in the um, papers last year, I mean, we sent out, again, entirely volunt voluntarily, um, teams of our experts to go and work in the uh, continental European plants to help them transfer the skills, to help them scale up to get to a, um, the quality uh, and the scale that were needed um, to actually vaccinate, generate you know, millions of vaccines. And actually that worked incredibly quickly. Normally scale up takes years and years and it's not linear. And the issue with cells is they're very, very complicated. So, uh, um, you know, the times when I'd, I'd get shouted at by ministers saying, um, you know, you're not doing this quickly enough. And so I'd go back to um, my manufacturing guys and said, look, I'm 99.9% .9 sure I'm absolutely on safe ground, but I just want to check, is there anything else we could do to uh, scale up what we're doing any more quickly and do it any, any, any faster? And um, one of my manufacturing guys paused and he said, well, you could try singing to the cells and ask them to uh, <laughs> grow faster. But the answer was, there isn't. This is a, this is a very complex, difficult, unpredictable, non-linear process. And it was done at record speed. So, I mean, actually, it's been a, a lovely story of, of, you know, real altruism and skills and commitment. That, that's fantastic. 
you've, you've talked, Kate, a little bit now about what it was like to be in the room where it happened, or perhaps more accurately, in the Zoom where it happened. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> you, you, um, and you've also talked about what it's like to, to have manufactured at such scale and at such speed. Could you perhaps talk a little bit about how you recruited people for the vaccine trials and, um, and what were some of the issues around that, particularly perhaps some of the ethical issues about exposing people in the trials to an illness, which was obviously you know, a great risk to them? So I'm going to just go back one stage, stage if that's okay. Um, so the first thing I had to do was obviously recruit a team. Um, and I was given a bomb disposal ex, um, engineer as my director general. And that's basically the person that sort of makes sure that the government processes are followed. Um, and he came from the private sector too, albeit he'd had a long career in the army running complex commercial projects. So basically the two of us uh, put together a team. I brought together the industry people. So, you know, scientific, clinical, manufacturing scale up and the sort of the legacy industry side of long-term planning. And Nick then brought together procurement, project management, diplomacy, because obviously we had a whole international angle. And so when we were talking about the clinical trials, um, there are two issues to running clinical trials quickly, assuming you've got material to test. Um, the first is the regulatory issue. So how quickly can you actually get regulatory consent to start putting these foreign uh, products into people? And um, MHRA, so it's led by a lady, June Rain, uh, basically did exactly what you, a, a good regulator should, be, should do. So instead of sitting back and saying, well, we'll wait until you have your final dossier and you can, you can submit it to us when you've, when you've completed everything, she said, actually, no, um, give us your, basically your outline essay plan, tell us what your submission's going to look like, and as and when you've got the data to populate the, the submission, drop it in, and we will, we will roll, review it as we're going along, so a, a rolling review. Um, and so the MHRA basically uh, turned, turned um, uh, submissions around massively quickly. So that was, that's one area of sort of red tape that was completely eliminated in, uh, in the COVID pandemic. So no longer a, a, um, one of the, the bottlenecks to getting clinical trials going. And so then the second thing is actually literally just getting people into the trials. And so I recruited this lady, Divya, into uh, our team. And anybody who's met her will just know you're forced to be reckoned with. She's completely fantastic. Um, you know, came from India on a sports scholarship, and you can see that she has the energy. So she basically said, we need to put together a national citizen registry so that as we go out and talk to different vaccine companies, we can make an offer, a UK offer, and we can offer them support on manufacturing scale-up, which was one theme that we were pushing, but we can also show that we can run their clinical trials quickly and efficiently and get the data out quickly. So um, obviously there was nothing... Uh, particularly knew about that. There was no reason why we couldn't, why the you know, NHS and UK couldn't have done this donkeys years ago. But anyway, they hadn't. So we used that as an opportunity to put it together. Uh, and so we worked with NHS Digital to basically put a uh, page on the NHS website to allow anybody to sign up to be contacted, being co to consent to be contacted about clinical trials. And um, that turned out to be really successful. So we've got north of 500,000 people uh, that signed up. But what was important is we had to make sure that those people that signed up were people who were at risk of infection because it'd be no good having a big database of you know 25-year-old fit young people. And because if you, you know, showing a vaccine would work in young people doesn't help you. You need to show that the vaccine works in those people who are elderly, frail, underlying disease, the people who are most at risk uh, to the COVID infection. Um, and so we ended up with over a third over the age of 60. So that was, again, a massive plus. And we were able to then attract companies to come and run their clinical trials in the UK because we had this uh, capability. And so when Novavax came, so that's a US company that was quick on the trial, was being slow on the manufacturing. Um, uh, but they came and they asked us initially to do a 10,000 uh, uh, person study, which uh, is, was about the biggest study that had ever been run in the UK for vaccines. 
and they wanted us to recruit the whole thing and be done and dusted in six weeks. So we took a deep breath and said, yep, we'll do that. And um, we got the sites and, and pinged the various people in the, on the database. Um, and then uh, the recruitment went so well that after a week or so, Novavex came back to us and said, we'd like to increase the size of the trail by 50%. We now want you to recruit 15,000 people, but on the same timelines. So we took another double gulp, said, yes, we'll do it, and we did. And so again, it was the, the ability for the UK to actually pull together the clinical trials and deliver incredibly high quality data has been one of the real um, jewels in the, in the uh, response to the pandemic. And it's not just in vaccines. I mean, I'm sure lots of you will remember the recovery study. So that's this big master protocol study, which basically means you have one placebo arm and then up to six different active arms. So anybody that was admitted into hospital in the UK had an opportunity to uh, enroll in the, in the trial. And it gave uh, data um, at, a, at a scale that it was statistically valid. So it's about 2,000 uh, patients an arm. Um, that alter the course of the treatment of COVID infection around the globe. And if you put that in context with the US, only 3% of clinical trials that were run in the, in the US actually generated any useful clinical data, whereas a vast majority of what was run in the UK generated actionable uh, regulatory supported clinical data. So one of the things that we really benefited from is the fact that we have a national health system and everybody has an NHS number. We've got access to clinical records and um, NHS in our country is you know, about the closest thing you get to a religion. We, people trust the NHS and being able to recruit that number of people into trials quickly. And of course that was Novavax. We did Oxford Novavax. Uh, Valneva, Johnson and Johnson, and then there were a whole lot um, GSK coming through, Medicargo, so a whole bunch of new ones, and that I think is one of the big uh, opportunities the UK now has going forward. And how can you actually expand that database beyond volunteers for vaccine studies now into all clinical trials, so that anybody has an opportunity to take part in trials, irrespective of whether they're being looked after by a physician that actually happens to be a, a, a investigator. And I think you yourself were in one of these clinical trials, weren't you? Yeah, never been. And, yeah. and how was it for you? What was it actually like being part of that trial? Could you perhaps describe it for the audience? Here? I mean, I was really pleased. I, I mean, I, I felt that it wasn't really fair to ask other people to take part in the trial if I didn't do it myself. And uh, as it turned out, I mean, it was blinded. So trials are, are obviously blinded because you want to be able to show that people that receive placebo get infected versus people who receive vaccine don't. Um, and so I, quite, I really liked it. I mean, it was exactly what it should have been, which was very careful checking, uh, all, all sorts of vital signs checked ahead of time and proper consenting to make sure I understood the risks and all of that. Um, I got given my first two shots, absolutely no effect at all. So they then did a crossover trial to, to, to keep people in the study. So um, instead of just having one arm of placebo and one arm of active, they then crossed it over. So anybody without knowing what you had, but having done four shots, you know that you've had two placebo, two active. So um, I went, when I was going in for my fourth shot, um, I said to the vaccination nurse, I said, you know, you get, you've been giving me water the whole way through because I've had no effect at all. And um, after that fourth shot, it then knocked me out. So I then knew <laughs> that, that my, my, my doses three and four were the active and do doses one and two were placebo. So it was a sort of self-unblinding. But, but I was really pleased to be part of it. And it's generated phenomenal data. The US has just published their data now on Novavax, identical to our data, but they published it months and months after we did. Fascinating. In terms of the decisions to prioritize vaccines um, to certain sectors of the population and so on, and the efficacy of the dose and the timing of when you space it out, those sorts of decisions, were you involved in, in those decisions as no. well? So my job was purely to get the vaccine. So the first thing I did was to ask the JCVI, so that's the Joint Committee of Vaccination and Immunization. So they are the, the vaccine experts that advise the government. Um, to ask them actually, you know, how many, how many vaccines do you want? And how many people do you want to vaccinate? So their answer, um, sort of this time last year, was they want to vaccinate those people who are vulnerable, who are at risk. And that is, was defined as all adults over the age of 50 and all adults 
under the age of 50, but with severe underlying disease, whether it's asthma, heart disease, cancer, whatever. Um, and so you'll have seen the, the purchases we made were in, in groups of, of 30. So if they were a two-dose vaccine, which they mostly are, uh, we'd be getting 60 million doses. And uh, in the Anson case, it's a single-dose vaccine, so we just got 30. So JCVI advised on numbers. JCVI advised then on priorita prioritization. And of course, as we've had more variants, um, their advice has expanded, so they've now expanded down to all adults and now down to children. Um, and I have to say, they've called it right 100% of the time. So if you, again, remember the global derision of the UK for, for recommending that every, as many people as possible should be vaccinated with a single dose and then to delay the timing of the second dose. And there was global outrage saying, but that's not what the clinical trials said. You know, the clinical trials had dosing either three or four weeks apart. And of course, the reason the clinical trials were designed with as short a, a dosing interval as possible is we wanted to get the data as soon as possible because we wanted to show whether or not these vaccines could actually protect against infection. But that didn't mean that that was the optimum time for dosing the, between the two vaccines. And um, anybody who studies immunology, and I am not an expert, but even I know this, um, know that actually if you delay the period between doses, you will enhance the immune response. And so the JCVI absolutely called it and stuck to their guns and said, no, uh, we want to uh, delay the, uh, the dosing interval to 12 weeks. And that means we can maximize as many people as possible to actually get a single dose. And then we will optimize the clinical response uh, with the, with the second delayed dose and the data proved them right and again if you look around the world everybody now despite their early criticisms are now adopting a delayed um, second dosing regime so I have to say I think JCPI absolutely nailed it on the head nothing to do with us we just followed orders and and responded to whatever they asked us for so big clap out to them You've talked quite a lot about the importance of manufacturing at scale, at speed, and so on. How important do you think it was to manufacture in the UK? So that was a, um, a long-term goal, but actually the, the main message from the Prime Minister was, you know, you need to do it quickly. People are dying, so it doesn't, it doesn't need to be perfect, but just get vaccines here as soon as you can. So... Um, uh, our focus actually was not that we had to have vaccines manufactured in the UK. From a long-term resilience perspective, we clearly need to have that flexible capability. Um, but, but that was not a criteria. So the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine was not manufactured in the UK. Um, uh, that's manufactured on the continent. Uh, the Janssen vaccine is not va um, uh, vac uh, manufactured here. We, we put in place an 18-month fill-finish contract. So that basically is... You, there's two stages of manufacture. You have to manufacture the actual vaccine itself, and then you have to put it into vials, and then you have to demonstrate quality and stability and so on. And so what we put in place was an ability to receive bulk drug substance, which we could then put into vials here in the UK, because fill finish was a massive global shortage. And so we felt that, again, would give us additional flexibility. We didn't know what we were going to put in the vials, but we felt that by having that um, capability, and again, as you know, these are all multi-dose vials, um, we, we would have more flexibility about what it was that we could receive and uh, purchase. So um, as it's turned out, we've got the capability um, uh, to manufacture in four separate sites. So Oxford Biomedica, um, basically took, took on what was the VMIT role, which is the Vaccine Manufacturing Innovation Centre, which the governments, previous governments had decided that was a good idea, but they just hadn't built it. So we had, although it was there in name, it wasn't there in anything other than name. So we built, the Oxford Biomedica did the manufacturing for, uh, for the Oxford vaccine and did a beautiful job, and is, continues to do a beautiful job, and is the most productive site anywhere in the world. Um, we bought a veterinary vaccine manufacturing plant because building de novo was going to take too long and just was not going to be responsive to the urgency of, of getting vaccine made. But actually converting and upgrading a veterinary plant uh, was something that we could, could do. So we did that, and that's run by what's called the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult and is able to manufacture, again, all of the different vaccine formats, but we earmarked it to, to manufacture mRNA. Um, and then we um, 
uh, supercharged one of the um, d development organizations up in uh, Darlington uh, called Fuji. So again, allowed them to scale up to in much larger bioreactors to be able to make more of the protein-based uh, vaccine. Um, and then Valneva, uh, which is the Scottish uh, plant that grows up whole inactivated, well, grows up whole viruses. So this is hot, growing live SARS-CoV-2. Then you inactivate it, and then you put that acts as the vaccine itself, which is a very standard, old-fashioned sort of uh, vaccine. Um, not quick, but super flexible. So again, if you need to grow up a variant, you can grow up a variant, and that can then become your vaccine. So we, that's what we put in place. Um, the only one that uh, is currently supplying vaccine to the UK at the moment is the Oxford Biomedica. Uh, Fuji is making it, but it, the vaccine's not approved yet. And then the other two are the are sort of the resilience uh, capabilities. So um, we definitely are better off now than we were. Um, and we'll just see how those go. So if we do scroll forward to now, I think a year ago you said our main job is to identify, manufacture and develop the most promising pandemic vaccines and deliver them rapidly to the populations that need them. COVID-19 gives us an opportunity to create a permanent system for supplying vaccines for future pandemics quickly and safely. This process must become as routine and reliable as crafting the yearly influenza vaccine. To what extent do you think that has been achieved? Uh, I'll give ourselves a B, probably. So I think we've, we've, we've got better. It's definitely better than it was. Um, but I don't think we're fully there yet. S I probably <laughs> should stop. <laughs> <laughs> so how many vaccines have now been licensed in the UK? Are there others which have been licensed in other countries or are still in development? Yeah, so we've got uh, three that are licensed. Uh, three that are licensed here. So it's um, Oxford... Uh, Pfizer-BioNTech and Moderna. I don't think Janssen has yet been licensed here. To be fair, it doesn't really make sense for some of the, the vaccines that are behind to, to devote a lot of time to getting UK uh, regulatory approval when there are other countries that need the vaccine more. So I think it is reasonable that, that we've been, that given that we're now fully supplied with, with vaccine, that those other countries should be prioritised ahead of us. Now, I'd like to make sure that we will get um, approvals um, to, to have the flexibility to use all those different vaccines. Um, but at the moment, it's, it's just, just three. I would expect in the next six months, we will probably have another two or three. So I think I'd expect, obviously, Janssen is being widely used elsewhere, just not here yet. Um, Novavax will get approved. Uh, Valneva will get approved. Um, and then the next generation, uh, GSK, vaccine will get approved. So that's four, I think, that will get approved probably in the next six plus months. And you've talked quite a lot and very eloquently about some of the factors that were responsible for the UK's success, the ability to scale up at speed, the role of the NHS, the role of JCVI and so on, uh, JPCTI. And are there any other factors which you would say were responsible for the success of the programme here as opposed to in other countries? Um, yes, of course. Um, so I'm a venture capitalist, so I, I work with novel science to turn them into new drugs to have uh, disease-altering effects on patients. So, um, of course, that's... You know, if, you're a hammer, if you are a hammer, everything you look at looks like a nail. So for me, we applied basically the same approaches as I would do for a venture capital investment, which is you know, the likelihood is a lot is going to fail. You're going to have to work very hard to make sure that uh, you work in partnership with your companies to, to make sure that anything that could be successful is successful. And that you put on the best possible expertise and help to um, allow people to, to allow whether it's comp my, my companies or vaccines to succeed. So we applied exactly that same approach. So we built a portfolio. We uh, we cut the losers quickly. Where it was clear that we weren't going to make it, we we chopped. Um, we put in place expert teams to support them, and and uh, all aspects, whether it's scale up, clinical trials, regulatory support, whatever we could do to to ensure that our companies that we'd contracted with would be most successful. 
Um, that's what we did for vaccines, and that's obviously what I do in, in venture capital. And I think that did work. Um, and, and this concept of risk and, and recognizing we were going to lose money. So we spent 900 million pounds up front on vaccines, which we didn't know whether or not they would work. So that was, that was the cost of, of, of um, the balance sheet to the, uh, you know, all of us, our taxpayers' money um, for scale up and running clinical trials before we knew whether they would work. And that was something which I think was highly unusual. So if you compare our approach to the approach of Europe, which has since been massively sort of uh, explored in the press, um, the, the approach the European Union took, which is actually the, the approach that all governments typically take, is a classic procurement approach, which is you, you line up all the different products, you quantify them and you rank them against each other, you decide which you want and then you go in and say, right, I'll have you know, 100 million of those. And that's not the way we worked because First of all, the data wasn't comparable. Uh, second of all, it was all coming in dribs and drabs, and um, you didn't have time to wait uh, till you had a complete data set. Because if you wait, waited until you'd have the complete data set, you would be uh, securing vaccines for delivery in 22. So that was hopeless. So you had to make early expert judgments, and we only did that by having an expert team that could do it. So one of the main reasons why I think we were successful was we were allowed to build a team that had that expertise, we had a single uh, decision-making process within government. So one of my anxieties about the, you know, too many fingers in the pot and too many people trying to you know, give official advice on all of this and going between departments, we ended up instead with an investment committee that had the secretaries of state for business, health, cabinet office and treasury. And we would submit a business case and if we needed to speak to them at, you know, late on a Friday night, we spoke to them late on a Friday night and we had a single decision. And the decision could be yes or it could be no. But we weren't going to go through the hoops and uh, be protracted. And that worked really well. And the ministers all stepped up. They read their papers. They asked us good questions. They made their spending decisions. So my role was not a spending role. It was a recommendation role. And then the other aspect was um, that we had a prime minister mandate. So whenever the uh, machine was started threatening to get guddled up, um, it, you know, I could go back and say, look, you know, I don't want to go back to the prime minister on this, but if I have to, I will. And <laughs> they knew I would. Um, and so actually, we had a we had a position where the government was willing to put cash up front at risk, which was unlike most governments. And since I stepped back. I had a whole host of different governments call me, France, Sweden, Germany, Brazil, um, Canada, a bunch of them, basically saying, you know, what did you do and how did you make it work? And m most of the other governments simply couldn't get their heads around the idea that the UK was willing to put cash up front to, um, to back vaccines before we knew whether or not they would work. And in the grand scheme of things, 900 million pounds is not a lot of money given the cost to the economy of being in lockdown and the cost of recovery if you could recover more quickly. And the average cost we spent per dose was a little over 10 pounds a dose. So it wasn't as if we threw money at it. Our average cost was comparable with that for the US and European Union. But we were willing to put money up front and that was, that was a big a big difference. So, you know, hats off for the trust, because I think a lot of governments wouldn't trust, you know, somebody from the private sector with no track records in government whatsoever, and say, you know what, we'll, we'll listen to your recommendations and we'll act on them. So, and, and our government did. So, you know, that was good. Thank you. Uh, uh, you said previously, I think, um, at least nine coronavirus viruses from bats have not crossed into humans. These, plus other zoonotic diseases and mutations in current strains, make future pandemics likely. If, God forbid, there should be another pandemic, are we better prepared? Uh, yes, I don't think we're fully prepared yet, but what, what we can do now with um, uh, AI and machine learning is actually to take all the different, I mean, those are coronaviruses, but there'll be a whole bunch of other pandemic viruses. Take those sequences now and say, you know, what, where could the mutations be that actually would, would lead to greater infectivity and uh, what, could those, what could those look like? So the first thing we can do is take the SARS-CoV-2. And so we've gone through alpha, beta, gamma, delta. We've now got sort of delta prime um, variant at the moment. 
but we can actually start predicting, well, where do you think the next mutations are likely to be? And so now we can start, we can make those sequences, make what those potential variant uh, uh, strains could look like, and then test them against our um, other vaccines we've got now. If we, and that was something we spent money in to basically reinforce our ability to test preclinically head to head. Um, if we find that those those variant those predicted variant strains actually uh, escape the current vaccines, well then we can start actually making the vaccines that can make those um, can actually address those those new strains. So there is there's certainly theoretically an ability to do that. That work is on, ongoing. Um, it's not something that UK should be doing alone though. So I think th this is this needs to be a global effort where. You know, basically, the the, glo the Western economies divvy up all the potential different uh, future pandemic strains and potential variants from this SARS-CoV-2, and then start thinking about well, can we start creating those seed banks to, so that we are we have the seed banks ready to scale up should should we need to. So I think we are better prepared. Um, we've got much better global monitoring, but again, the UK is doing about 50% of the global surveillance. Uh, in terms of sequencing of, of strains. So again, we need to get better uh, joined up and more supportive uh, uh, collaborations with other countries. And I think that's coming. So are we out of the woods? Absolutely no way. Are we better off than we were? Yeah. Thank you, Kate. At this point, perhaps it makes sense to open it up to the floor for some questions. I've got lots of questions, but you have as well. Um, gentlemen here in the second row, first of all, perhaps. The mic is just on its way. Yeah, I, I have two questions, actually, if you don't mind. One is, you know, I th clearly, um, I think the rest of the world has learned a lot from the, the UK response to the vaccine. But I think also the UK can learn from others. I mean, the, Biont uh, the BioNTech-Pfizer development went pretty quick, too and they had much clearer data, and they've been approved by the FDA, whereas um, AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine hasn't, as far as I know. That's question number one. Number two is that um, trying to develop therapeutics, as you know, is equally long, equally risky, takes 10 years, and yet for patient suffering, it can be as much a personal emergency as the pandemic is a global emergency. So what do you think the learnings are for therapeutic development? Uh, maybe I'll go backwards. Um, so therapeutics just didn't have the same emphasis of developments. Uh, uh, that has been ticked up since, so that they created a therapeutics antiviral task force um, at the beginning of the year. So, and you've seen that uh, the announcement was this week that they've secured rights to the Merck and the Pfizer uh, uh, antivirals, neither of which are approved yet, but at least with Merck, you've got some good data that show that's effective. So I think learnings are that if you actually want to accelerate the development of therapeutics, you need to, at the moment, you need to bring in expertise outside government uh, to, to help accelerate that. Because at the moment, we do not have people within government that have the, the right scientific, um, clinical, and industrial um, expertise. It's just not the skill set we've got. So I think that could be done better, but, and I think that's on the way. In terms of the difference between the Oxford um, trials and the BioNTech, um, the Oxford vaccine was developed by academics um, and they were designed to answer academic questions rather than being designed by industry to get regulatory approval. And of course, AZ stepped in and worked with Oxford, but only uh, in April after, and the, the Oxford got going in, in January. So um, the, the actual study design was more complex in, for Oxford, and there were mistakes. Um, and so some of the academic assays uh, didn't actually translate. So this whole issue about what the dose was, was just that the, the, um, the assay wasn't reproducible and they ended up getting the actual number of viral-like particles in a dose uh, wrong. Um, and that, in a way, you know, people are working very hard and mistakes get made. Uh, it's, it's more likely when uh, people are doing things out of their normal course of business, so it's less likely to happen in industry, but when that's all they do is to make sure that everything is is uh, developed according to very specific protocols. 
Um, but there were advantages to it. So the and, and there was no question that there was significant political antagonism by the FDA towards the Oxford AZ vaccine. So when they um, had their first um, adverse event, uh, they were put on hold for seven weeks. When Janssen had, with basically the same type of vaccine, had the same adverse event uh, in their trials, they were put on hold for a week. So there was, there's, there was no question that there was political uh, influence as to how they managed the, the work between the, and the submissions between the different companies. Um, Oxford's been, or AZ's been told they will not, the FDA will not accept an emergency use authorization. So they will only accept a full authorization now, uh, which is a massive uh, piece of work compared with emergency use. And there's no, I, mean, I can't see why the FDA would say that. Um, uh, but the advantage of the Oxford, and, and the way JVT described it, was messy homework, which is, a bit, which is true, as in it had the right content there, but it was just a bit, you know, there's a bit of too many crossings out and things that slightly went wrong. Um, but the advantage of it was the Oxford trial was originally designed as a single dose, just like the Janssen study has been. Um, and what they discovered, because they ha were an academic-led study with lots of different um, arms um, exploring different... Um, combinations and different patient types and so on, um, is that one of the arms early on, they, they thought, well, we'll try two doses, but even though we think this is a single dose trial. And what became clear is they were going to need to do a single, a second dose. So they went back to all those people who had originally signed up for this trial to do a one dose uh, trial, say, actually, we want you to come back to, do, to get a second dose. And what that enabled them to do was to then generate data that had people getting their second dose four weeks later through to people getting their data 12 weeks later. So when JCVI made that recommendation about extending the second dose, they had some data from the Oxford trial because they had a spectrum of people getting their doses at different delayed periods, which showed the enhanced immunogenicity. So is it, was it a perfect trial? No. Was it a, an astonishing trial for something that was run by academia, then brought in, then partnered with industry? Yes. AZ has vaccinated over 20% of the world and it's approved in 170 countries. Now, no other university will ever be able to claim anything like that, ever. Um, they provide 50% of the supply to COVAX. And so, yes, it is a slightly messy homework, and it's not a perfectly run uh, relationship. They've clearly had a rocky time with the FDA, but to have that as the outcome, um, I think is really impressive. Thank you for a great question. I think we've got a question right here up in the front. I'll give shorter answers next Hi. time. No, no, no. I just, I'm, you seem completely unflappable. <laughs> but, um, but given the sort of press for all the whole time criticism, um, all the dramas that happened during your, um, during your presiding over this process, um, did you ever have moments of complete panic, um, firstly? Um, it seems, you, looking at you, it seems impossible, that, that, that was unthinkable, that you could have a moment's panic. But did you ever sort of have, it, have sleepless nights? And secondly, you talked about the prime ministerial mandate, which was kind of unique in this country, that you had that. How often did you have to call up the prime minister um, and, and say, listen, I need you to clear this path for me now? Um, so the first question, moments of panic, I, my husband's standing at the back, um, you ask him, the answer is, uh, <laughs> when the press was having a go at me, absolutely, it's, it feels like panic. I was stuck in Wales on my own, and it's a really weird thing. I mean, I've come from the private sector, I've come in to do this for free, I actually knew we'd been doing a great job. Uh, the press was having a field day at the very time when the Pfizer data was coming out. And we were the first to secure the Pfizer vaccine. It, the vaccine was way more effective than uh, we all thought. Um, and we had 10% of the global supply. So what was there not to like? And yet I was getting all this chumocracy, you don't know what you're doing, you don't understand immunology, you're self-enriching, you're incompetent. I mean, it was, it was bizarre. Um, and Jess's advice to me was basically, take your ego out of it, eye on the prize. And just focus on what you've been asked to do and try and forget about it. Now, it's quite difficult to forget about it. Um, and so then uh, the kids introduced me to a Lily Allen song, which is, I'm not going to repeat it, but it's a rude song. And so I would be able to go from my runs and listen to this, and that was, it would make me laugh at least. <laughs> you need to ask your teenagers. <laughs> right. That, yeah. The Prime Minister. Oh, the PM. Um, I, um, the main one was when the press was having a go, actually. 
Uh, and then I just said, look, if, if you think I'm doing a good job, uh, I need you to come out in support of me. And if you're not, that's completely fine. And, and I can step back, but you need to do one or the other. Um, and he absolutely stepped up. Another question there, I think, in the fourth oh, row. Well, we need to do some at the back as well. Yeah, let's do some at the back. You're right. There's a, if that's not too problematic with the mics, maybe we could. There's a, a lady there. Thank you. Hi. Um, how instrumental would you say the use of uh, HeLa cells were in the development of the Oxford vaccine, the cells of Henrietta Lacks? I don't have a view. Mm-hmm. As in to, you don't know? Or no, I know, I know what HeLa cells are, but I don't know how important they were. Okay. How about um, just the, the lady behind you who's had her hand up? Can I just say how impressive I am with you and what you've achieved and listening to you this morning? It's been very, very inspiring. But my question is, you mentioned data a lot, and I know that Israel was very advanced with its own vaccination problem. So was the data that was formed there able to help us here in the UK? A little bit. I mean, it's, Israel has informed on the, the uh, decisions about boosters and waning immunity. So Israel basically only had the Pfizer vaccine, and they weren't quite as strict in terms of uh, order of priority of vaccination. So we were able to get data that will have informed the JCVI on how uh, different cohorts should be vaccinated and what the likely uh, waning effect is of the different vaccines. So what, when the level of protection is starting to come off. Now ours was somewhat different in that we had part Pfizer, part AZ, and Pfizer wanes more quickly than AZ. AZ is likely to give a slightly broader response, even though you don't get that very high level of antibodies immediately. So I think it, I think it has been important. Maybe we could come back to the patient man here who's had his hand up for quite a long time. If the mics could, could come back to the, to the front, please. Thank you. Uh, Kate, uh, I applaud your VC approach and the cooperation of the government to support it, which is fantastic. Uh, in, a, in a similar international mindset, uh, Australia has, and New Zealand has like, something like 2,000 COVID deaths. Uh, where UK is at 180,000. Did you have discussions with the Prime Minister or the government about the difference in approach of an island like Australia and New Zealand versus UK's approach as an island as well? No, because that's not my job. My job was, I mean, that's political com uh, uh, decisions about whether to keep borders open and whether or not, in fact, uh, there was too much virus already circulating to, to affect the borders. But no, that's nothing to do with me. My job was purely about identifying the best vaccines um, in fact, University of Queensland developed one of the early vaccines, uh, but they incorporated an HIV protein. So it meant that anybody that received it would then test positive for HIV. So um, not a great vaccine to use, even if it was effective. Thank you. And at the back there, there's a question, please. Thank you. Yes, good morning. Um, my question is, with your VC hat on and what you've learned, where do you think the UK sits in terms of discovery and innovation within the medical industry and life sciences in terms of you know, radical uh, you know, transformational uh, drugs being developed for the diseases of tomorrow and today? Um, we sit pretty strongly because, um, as I said, it, again, the data that we've got through um, NHS records and um, electronic health records, a lot, and, and then we've got you know, Biobank, Genomics England, we've got enormous depth of genotype data together with clinical data. And um, so actually, if you think about one, and, and, it's, and the plan's in place to extend that to 5 million people now uh, from the 500,000. So um, being able to actually start thinking about how do you bring, first of all, how do you uh, define mechanisms that are driving disease with those sorts of, again, combine that with, with academic uh, basic science then with patient samples so that you can actually start doing things like you know, single cell sequencing and some of the massive genomics uh, capability that we have now, uh, we're in a very good position. Um, there are no other countries that have the same level of joined up uh, basic science with clinical and then the ability to run clinical studies. So I think we're in a, in a very strong position. Are we the world leader at every single area of basic science? Of course not. Are there big chunks where we have lacunae? Yes. Um, but we definitely do have 
key areas of real expertise uh, where the UK is, is global, uh, globally leading. So I, as an investor, uh, I'm very happy to be investing here. We've got time, I think, for a couple more questions. So um, there's one here at the front and then one at the back. Sorry. Uh, you talked about the UK sending colleagues into European institutions to help on the scaling up, which is a good citizen story I was unfamiliar with. And I wondered, A, whether there are other international good citizen stories that we haven't heard about or haven't heard about enough, and whether there's any attempt to kind of bag these together in a communique that would um, celebrate this kind of collaboration. So I don't know about um, what the government plans to say about it. I mean, the other, the other area which I think has not really been widely discussed is uh, the UK's contribution to de designing the COVAX scheme. So COVAX is the global um, vaccine facility to, for low and middle income countries. And uh, the guy we had on our team, who's a former diplomat, was just had unending patience uh, to help shape this into a a scheme that actually worked. Because, I mean, crudely speaking, you need the rich countries to fund the vaccine purchases for the poor countries. Um, but the way it was originally designed just wasn't um, something that the, the wealthy countries were going to take up. So it had to be designed in such a way that it uh, was politically um, acceptable for the different high-income countries around the world. So that's something I don't think had any time of day. No one think knows about that. And yet I think if you spoke, speak to COVAX, they would say that the UK played a very key role in that. We seconded people and, and staff and not as well as the whole expertise of, of how it should be shaped, and which is ultimately how it is shaped. So I think that has worked out well. Thank you. And then the question at the back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you talked about the uh, importance of collaboration and sharing, sharing of data uh, and knowledge, including between nations. How was the balance achieved between that and the importance of the um, intellectual property in the various vaccines that were developed here? How did you protect that? Yeah, so IP has been a bit of a sideshow, actually. So, um, I mean, there's been lots of chat about how these vaccine countries, companies, specifically the mRNA companies, have not shared IP, and that's been a constraint to global supply. That is not the case. Um, uh, in the case of Oxford AstraZeneca, they did what uh, other, country, other companies can do, which is to manufacture, to sign contracts to allow their vaccine to be manufactured under license. So the Serum Institute of India manufactures the Oxford vaccine, man will manufacture the Novavax vaccine, um, equivalent companies manufactures the Janssen vaccine. So it's not about IP per se, it's about having the skilled resources that actually know how to do it. The fact that we in the UK were shipping people to the continent to help them do it shows it's not straightforward. And so it's not just a matter of a pop-up plant in Africa and suddenly you give them the IP and then they know what to do. That wouldn't happen. So it, it only can happen if you've got um, skilled, capable workforce that actually know how to do it and it's not, not uh, easy. So that is a long-term uh, global political challenge is to how do you create that capability around the world so that you don't end up with, again, the vaccine nationalism with uh, countries just manufacturing for themselves, but how do you get the broad enough supply so that you can actually create the vaccine that can, can uh, be exported to all those countries that need it. But it's not, an, it's not a fundamental IP issue. There's a very patient person at the back who's had their hand up for a long time. Now, the last question to you, please. With the vaccine having only been created over a couple of months and been released to the public less than a year ago, how do you know the long-term impacts of taking the vaccine on people's immune system and health? Uh, great question. Um, the answer is that um, significant side effects um, or any side effects typically happen within the first two months of from dosing. So um, you will you may not remember, but there was a the FDA, which is the U.S. regulator, put in place a rule that there had to be two months uh, of safety monitoring before they would accept any registration. MHRA had exactly the same approach. So that two-month safety testing has been uh, evaluated for all 
um, vaccines. And remember um, that these vaccines just go in and they disappear very quickly. So in the case of mRNA, they are only present for a very short period of time to basically allow cells to make, use the, the, to transcribe the genetic material to make the spike protein. And that's what then stimulates the immune response. And then it all goes back down again. So that ultimately what we're creating is a memory bank of T and B cells that can then respond next time they see that spike protein. So it's, uh, it's not likely that there's any long-term response. The, the, the toxicity, if there are any, and what we've seen are very, very, very rare side effects. Um, now with nearly 4 billion people being dosed, um, those side effects come, come in very quickly after, after the dose. So I, think, I don't think we're going to see any long-term side effects. Um, and then the question is, well, how can we take the, the side effects we are seeing, even if they are very rare, how can you, how can you uh, reduce those even further? So with that, Kate, I'd like to, on behalf of all of us here this morning, thank you very much indeed for your absolutely <laughs> fascinating insights over the course of the last hour, and also to the audience for the great questions. Kate, thank you so Brilliant. much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.